This is part two of our section on Christianity. So in the last lesson, we looked at the Bible and Jesus and the teachings that are, that are the basis of Christianity. In this lesson, we're going to look at uh, church history up through the Middle Ages. So that is uh, the multitude of Christian paths and teaching that existed in the first and second centuries. Um, the role of Paul in um, forming uh, an organized uh, church and church administration. Um, the Council of Nicene, which finally set down um, the exact uh, creeds and beliefs that Christianity, they believed, um, should follow. And uh, we'll get into um, the role of uh, monasticism and mysticism in medieval Christianity, and we'll talk a little bit about the schism between East and West as well. Okay. So, um, in 306, Around 306 CE, Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome at the time, which, and Rome was still, uh, technically it was, uh, it followed Roman religion, which is pagan religion. Emperor Constantine uh, converted to Christianity, he began sponsoring Christianity as uh, the empire's new religion. Um, he uh, called a council in 325 uh, at Nicaea, to affirm Jesus' divinity and to kind of um, set the record straight on the stories about Jesus. Um, in the following centuries, a number of thinkers, such as St. Augustine, St. Benedict, uh, Thomas Aquinas, all tried to set down or, or to, to tease out further exactly what Christian doctrine is. Um, and this is an interesting part of Christianity that we don't see in a lot of other religions. We don't see this in Western religions as much, or in Eastern religions as, as much. In Eastern, Asian religions, if there are new te texts being written, they might be um, they might be teachings. Confucianism had uh, uh, continually had new teachings being written down. But Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Shinto, Taoism, if anything was being written about those, it was, it was more likely to be more stories. Um, Buddhism had a, a growing um, canon of stories about bodhisattvas, for example. Um, in Christianity, you see um, all the writers are talking about dogma. Because for Christianity, the, ha the, the historical narrative is finished. The, the myths, the stories are finished now. Jesus came, he redeemed humanity, that's done. All there's left to do is to um, tease out the exact um, uh, teachings and rules and um, truths about the unseen reality. And so people like Augustine and Benedict and, Saint, and Thomas Aquinas all um, uh, were trying to do that in the years that followed um, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, the East, East and West Europe split around 1054 into the Catholic Church and the uh, Orthodox Church. Won't, won't be until about 1517 that Protestantism begins, and then we'll talk about Protestantism in our next lecture. So as early as the first century CE, Christianity had more than one bureaucracy that carried on the rights of the church. I attempted to define mainstream Christianity. Christianity. It was already uh, denigrating trends that, ju that it judged her heretical. So already we had uh, a number of different groups claiming to have the true stories, the true gospels of Jesus. We talked about in the last lecture, there were multiple gospels going around. They didn't all agree with one another. Um, there are also, also multiple teachings, multiple ideas about how to set up a church, how to set up authority, what were the roles of women, what was the role of um, leaders, um, you know, what was the role of Jewish law. Um, and uh, there was a, a good deal of debate going on at that time about how to um, how to run the church. The bottom here, we have a couple of common symbols in early Christianity. This word here, ichthus, is a Greek word, ichthus. It means fish, because Jesus told his disciples he would make them fisher fishers of men, right? They would they would uh, go fishing for men and for converts. 
So uh, the word fish and the symbol of a fish was a really common Christian symbol in the beginning, as I mentioned in the last lecture. Um, early Christians were really uncomfortable portraying Jesus literally, so they had a number of different symbols they used. A shepherd boy, um, fish, the Cairo, which we'll look at. And this here, <laughs> look, it's it looks like the Dharma wheel, <laughs> doesn't it? It has eight spokes. This is actually a symbol for this word exists right? Um, this is, uh, if you took all of these letters, you put one on top of another, it would make something similar to this wheel. So there's the, um, the I, the iota. There is the key right there, like looks like an X. Theta, it's right here, a circle and a line through the middle. And then you have um, Upsilon right here, right? You can find that right there. And uh, sigma is a little bit harder. You have to use your imagination a little bit, but sigma's right here, right? So this the symbol looks just like the Dharma wheel. I think it's funny. Is um, a symbol for um, the ichthys. It's a symbol for fish. The early Christians used. And this is this uh, picture here was just a bit of graffiti found in a wall in uh, the ancient Roman Empire. So someone just scrawled it on the wall somewhere. Uh, it's interesting if you study archaeology, the, the Romans were very fond of, um, of graffiti. There was a lot of graffiti, pictures, words, messages, you know, uh, on walls all over Rome, just as they are all over um, our buildings today. So early Christianities, there were multiple Christianities um, running around the first couple cent the first few centuries. The one we're probably most familiar with is called Pauling. Um, we'll talk about uh, the Apostle Paul in a moment, but uh, the Apostle Paul um, had a very uh, had a very um, firm and clear idea of what Jesus's message was, what Jesus's role was in humanity, what the meaning of the crucifixion was, and he wrote prolifically. He, he wrote a number of letters, and we have uh, uh, many of them, um, and uh, his ideas became the foundation for what became mainstream Christianity. At that time, it was just another Christian group. There were also a number of Jewish Christians. These were um, people who still kind of identified as Jewish, um, but believed that um, Jesus had, was the Messiah come, right? But they weren't letting go of the law. They weren't letting go of Jewish identity. And many of them were uncomfortable allowing non-Jews to become Christians themselves. So that was um, a major group for a long time. The Montanists were a relatively small group, but they're an interesting one. They believed that um, the, the tradition of prophecy had continued even after Jesus had had died and been resurrected, um, and that there were uh, there were male prophets, there were female prophets. Um, they had a tradition of prophecy, and, and this was in um, what is now modern day Turkey, but uh, back in the Roman Empire. Gnostics we talked about. Gnostics believed that um, the message of Jesus was not for everyone. It was only for an elite few who had the, the spiritual knowledge, the spiritual wisdom to understand his messages and his secrets. There was also Arianism. Arianism was based on a man named Arius, who in the third century um, had uh, spent a lot of time studying uh, the, the Christian writings, the Jewish writings, and he decided that clearly um, the, the person that Jesus called Father could not be the same as the, as the Old Testament God. He believed the Old Testament God was something else, was a creator, God who was, who was a God of laws and uh, was a very strict and not a very loving God, but that um, Jesus, was, um, Jesus had a, a different Father, a different God um, that he spoke of. And so that, um, this, that Jesus represented like a, a, a new generation in a sense. Um, and uh, he was chased out of the Roman Empire for that belief. Um, this was uh, it, the, the debates over um, Christian doctrine were really quite heated, and there were um, claims of heresy flying back and forth. Everyone was claiming that someone else was a heretic at the time, and uh, we'll see how that that kind of tradition of um, trying to um, ascertain exactly what is truth in Christianity and what is not true, how that continues on into the Middle Ages. And there were other groups of um, early Christians as well. Um, there were groups who, I mean, all sorts of groups. A lot of the Gnostics also believed that, um, that Jesus was perhaps just a man who had been possessed by the Holy Spirit. Um, 
other uh, groups believed that perhaps uh, Jesus had never taken physical form because uh, physical form is something that's impure and something that's beneath the spirit and so the spirit of God could never take the form of a person but rather he was just an illusion it was just an, an illusion of a man when in fact um, Jesus had never taken a physical form um, there were all sorts of like I say there were just all sorts of ideas flying back and forth and and many groups that were somewhere in between and, and groups that were undecided as to to what they believed this picture here just a few more early Christian symbols an anchor uh, which was, which is supposed to be kind of an, uh, a, I guess a, a version um, of a cross, and also um, draws attention to again the, the stories of, of, of the disciples being fishermen. Um, there's a fish, and here down in the corner is the famous hero, which um, is the Greek letters, the first two Greek letters in Christ, which means the Anointed One. Right, so we call Jesus the Christ. We're saying he's anointed the way a king is anointed. He's the anointed one. We call him the Messiah. Um, this is a Jewish term, which means like the Son of God. Um, so, and uh, that is where the key row comes from. You can see right there. There's an X, which in ancient Greek was pronounced he, and then and uh, uh, looks like a P, but it was an ancient R. So, C R was basically what that is short for Christ. Um, so Paul comes along um, and he comes around along about oh, about 10, 20 years after uh, Jesus' death. Um, he was a Jewish man, but he was also a Roman, right? So he spoke Greek fluently, he spoke um, Aramaic, he was a traveler, he's cosmopolitan, he was very learned, he was literate and wrote many letters. Um, his name was Saul. He was of the Pharisee tradition, right? So he was of the rabbinical tradition and, and studied the law very carefully. And according to um, the the book of Acts in the New Testament, um, he had a conversion experience where he saw a bright light um, on the road and uh, uh, Jesus Christ appeared to him and uh, called him to, to help um, spread his church. And uh, Paul spent the rest of his life um, spreading the message of Jesus and in fact was um, imprisoned and eventually martyred. He was eventually killed for these beliefs, but he spent most of his life doing that. Um, if, Christian, if Christian belief is based on Jesus' teachings, the church itself is very much based upon Paul's work. Because Jesus never really left the, the area of Galilee, according to the, the New Testament. He spent all of his life in a very small area. Um, he never wrote down any of his ideas. He had a relatively small group of disciples um, when he died. Um, and those disciples began spreading uh, the, the, the message, messages of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, but they were mostly spreading them to um, other Jews, right? This was the Jewish Christian group. Paul and a few others um, really believed strongly that um, Jesus' message was for all humanity. And Paul traveled mostly by boat, or mostly on foot, but occasionally on boat. He went across the entire Roman Empire, um, uh, uh, establishing churches. And he not only established churches and converted people, but he kept up correspondences with them. You look at, there's a large portion of the New Testament is just Paul's letters to these various churches who, who turn to him for advice. Advice on theology, advice on... Um, you know, creating harmonious uh, communities, advice on how to deal with Roman officials, advice on the Jewish law and how much should be followed and how much should be, shouldn't be followed. This wonderful picture here of um, Paul sitting in prison and he's still writing, right? He's thinking very carefully about the way he, about what he's writing. Um, he was definitely a thinker um, and um, he was very devout and very pious. Um, his interpretations of the gospel in the form of these epistles, which are letters, um, the epistles that he wrote, became the basis for Christian theology. Um, one thing, uh, a couple important things that he added to the church, he interpreted Jewish law as no longer being necessary. He didn't think you need to, if you followed Christ, he thought you didn't need to follow the Jewish law. And that was a big question in the beginning, because there were a number of Romans and Greeks 
who were interested in converting to Christianity, but they didn't want to be circumcised as Jewish men were. They didn't want to follow the laws of kosher. They, you know, they they weren't interested in the Torah law so much. Um, and uh, Paul argued very strongly that the law was not necessary for Christians because they were redeemed. Um, and the law was for, um, you know, a, a pre-redemption world, so to speak. Um, Paul also argued that salvation was was uh, was available for all people through repentant faith. So not just faith, but a sense of repentance, right? Early on in Christianity, there's an encourage um, there's a lot of encouragement to to embrace one's own humility um, and uh, and to remember that we've all fallen from grace, as Christians would say. Um, just, as, just as Jesus set an example of living a very humble life, of being baptized, of living a, a, a poor life, and um, spending his time with poor people, right? So Christians should follow that example and uh, be repentant and be humble and have faith. Um, Paul also um, preached that um, an important part of uh, a Christian uh, it should be agape love and gnosis. Gnosis. Gnosis is how it's pronounced. Um, so agape is a Greek word that means kind of a, a brotherly love, right? Love for 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 um, uh, all people around you, and add, love as equals. Um, Paul thought that that was an important part of any Christian's life that they should try and find this love for one another and live in love for for one another. Also, um, he believed very strongly that um, while well, knowledge was important, remember the Gnostics were, were, were suggesting that um, there were all these secrets in Jesus' message that certain people weren't smart enough to understand. Um, Paul believed that, um, that um, the knowledge of God was important, but it should be a knowledge that was based in love and devotion, right? Um, in some ways, it's it's almost a little bit similar to um, a Hindu devotional idea of you know just loving God fully and and, and understanding through that love. Um, so, God and gnosis uh, were uh, both important parts of his message. Um, so, if the exchange of ideas and also debate came to characterize early Christianity's development early on. Um, Christianity found a lot of um, naysayers, I guess you could say, and we have this in writing. We have a good deal of accounts of uh, Christians debating their own uh, religion's theology and their philosophy with Jews, also with um, Greeks and Romans who are pagans, um, and this uh, sort of um, the challenges. The, the intellectual challenges, I guess, and theological challenges that the early Christians faced forced them to very quickly um, try to establish um, what Christianity was, what their beliefs were, what um, Jesus had really done in his life, which of the Gospels were true, which weren't. All of these questions about what Christianity was and what it believed and what it did became very important very quickly because it was facing a great deal of pressure in the Roman Empire. Um, and a, a great deal of not just persecution, but just, um, I guess you could say, um, dislike, dislike just in general. Um, Christians were persecuted on and off um, in those few centuries, not, not consistently, um, but on and off. Um, they were accused of being atheists. That sounds strange to you, but the word atheist, it's actually a Greek word, and it, it means someone who denies the existence of gods. Not all the gods, but gods, right, in the ancient world, and, and you see this kind of in Asian religion as well, there's no reason to deny the existence of other people's gods, because you don't really know, right? In, 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 in a lot of these traditions, it's not so important to know for sure. Um, you follow your tradition and you do it and you're faithful to it. But for Christians and also for Jews, this was also, um, by the way, this was a criticism that was placed on Jews as well, to say that there is only one God and the other gods don't exist um, was, was considered atheism, right? Because you're denying the existence of most of the gods. Um, this was also a political issue because in uh, ancient times, in ancient Rome, part of the duty of a Roman citizen 
was to pay taxes and to um, uh, offer prayers to the state gods because Rome and each of the major Roman cities had patron gods that protected the empire and protected those cities and part of your duty as a citizen was to give offerings of incense or food or anything to the gods to help protect um, the emperor and to protect the empire right that was a show of loyalty and that was a show of, of piousness so for Christians and for Jews to refuse to do that um, it was a kind of a political act it was kind of like saying it was almost kind of like saying um, I don't care about the I don't care about the empire I don't care about the country right it would be like if in modern day um, someone refused in modern America um, someone claimed to be I don't know maybe um, an anarchist and say I don't believe in the government and I don't support the government and I'm not going to pay my taxes and I'm not going to follow these rules right this was a, a seen as a political action. It wasn't a political action for Christians and Jews. They, they still wanted to be members of the Roman Empire. They simply, um, because of their religion, could not offer um, uh, offerings to the gods. So um, also because Jesus, had, the, the leader of Christianity, had been executed for sedition, um, that was seen as politically radical. Um, by Roman authorities um, and the fact that this man was said to be the king the king of kings and, and a greater king than you know even the emperor himself and that um, some Jews had spoken of the Messiah someone who was gonna who was gonna defeat the Romans so that Israel could be free you know all of these I all of these kinds of ideas surrounding the idea of a Messiah um, made the Roman authorities misunderstand um, Jesus's role amongst Christians right Jesus was not out to overthrow the Roman Empire, but you can see how from a Roman authority's point of view it might seem that he was, um, and that these people who are following him um, must also be interested in overthrowing the power. And another interesting and odd criticism placed on Christians was that uh, they, they were accused of cannibalism <laughs> because uh, they would act out uh, from the early time, they would act out the, the Last Supper when Jesus, the night before Jesus was, was crucified. He sat down with his disciples and he had bread and he had wine and, and Jesus said, take, eat this bread, it is my body that I'm giving for you. And he said, drink this wine, it is my blood that I'm spilling for you. And so from the very beginning, Christians would reenact this meal and share bread and wine um, in remembrance of, of what Jesus did and what he said. Um, and again, people who didn't know anything about Christianity um, would hear that, that, that the Christians were having these meals where they were talking about blood and body, and um, they were accused of being cannibals. Um, there were a lot of odd criticisms hurled against the Christians in the early days. What this did, though, ultimately, is it made um, the Christian communities, I, get, I think, in a lot of ways, stronger. It made them um, stick together more. It, it made um, Christian thinkers think harder and think of more arguments um, to, to prove their worth and their validity in a world that was full of gods. I actually read a book on, on ancient Roman religion and it's called A World Full of Gods. Right? There are so many different gods. Uh, polytheistic religion like Hinduism, there are, there are gods of all kinds, right? And so for this, this early cult, this Christian cult, to um, stay together and to um, not be, I guess, drowned out or ignored or, um, you know, um, stomped out, um, the Christian communities really had to stick together. Um, the earliest years of what became mainstream Christianity, Pauline Christianity, is described in the epistles, right? The, the, epistles, the letters of Paul and the letters of um, Peter and uh, several others. Um, down the bottom here, there's this is another painting of um, from the catacombs of Rome, and um, people for a long time mistook this as an image of the Last Supper. But in fact, what it is, it is uh, what is called an agape love feast. The early Christians would gather for meals together. That was very common in the ancient world, right? For groups to gather, when groups would gather together, they would have a meal together. And it was a communal thing, right? It was about community. It was about socializing. Um, it was about, uh, in, in religious contexts and, and other religious groups, Greek uh, religions, religious groups, Roman religious groups would have these sorts of meals as well. It would allow for the exchange of ideas, 
Right. So the earliest Christians would have an, a, 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 a love feast, an agape feast, um, that would allow them to, to socialize and to share ideas. Um, and then afterwards, they would have a symbolic Last Supper meal. And this um, painting, as I say, was his, was mistaken for a long time as um, an image of, of Jesus and the disciples in the Last Supper, but it's not. It's, it's an agape meal. And you can tell especially because there are only seven people. And if it was the Last Supper, there would be 13 people. Or 14, actually. Um, so... By the end of the first century, it was very only maybe 70 years after the death of Jesus already, there was um, slowly a, a church structure, an administrative structure growing, developing in the ancient world. Um, in the beginning, it was kind of this uh, charismatic life. People would travel around and preach and baptize and prophecy, and, and sometimes they die as martyrs, and there are all of these stories about these um, traveling um, prophets and traveling teachers going about. Um, very slowly, people, other people start to move towards a more institutionalized church, a patriarchal church where women were, uh, or didn't, didn't hold um, positions of power, where there were you know, very specific um, uh, localized places, to, local places to meet, like house churches in the beginning. Um, there were no churches, people would meet in homes. And there might be, um, if, if, you, if there was a rich family in your town that was Christian, you'd all gather there because they'd have a large home, they'd have an agape meal. Very slowly, this, this structure was building. But there was also a lot of traveling preachers. Um, and again, this is where all the different stories of Jesus were coming from, all of these different preachers with all these different stories and ideas. By the beginning of the second century, um, they, there had been there was a consolidation of spiritual power, right? So very slowly, certain figures are emerging as leaders, as, as respected leaders, especially in major cities, there are respected leaders. Um, they were acting as clergy, they were acting as bishops, um, and uh, these respected leaders were slowly gaining authority, not just over their own church, but their city, their region. And over time, these, these would become, you know, um, church seats in the empire. Um, and so it was a, kind of, that was kind of a slow organic process and there was also then a lot of communication um, between these various um, early bishops and leaders about again um, what texts are you reading and what you know stories of Jesus do you use and what do we really believe and what do we not believe um, it was a very important uh, discussion that had to happen in early Christianity um, down at the bottom here, we have a picture, again, from the catacombs. The catacombs are such beautiful um, and interesting early Christian art. This is a woman, and she has her head covered, but her hands are up, and, and there are people sitting on either side of her listening to her. And there's been a lot of debate about the role of women in early Christianity. And to be perfectly honest, we just don't know for sure. We do know that there were deaconesses. Um, so people who were kind of um, women who who were taking um, the role of deacons, who kind of helped with the day-to-day -day affairs in a church, um, organizing meetings and organizing food and organizing sometimes financial matters. Um, it's not really known whether or not they were praying and preaching. They might have been. There, there, there are hints of within the gospel, not within the gospels, but within the epistles and within other early church writings that there might have been women leaders. Um, maybe priests, maybe not, maybe bishops, maybe not, probably not bishops. But um, we, then we have pictures like this um, that suggest that, that women might have been preaching in early churches. But again, we, we don't know for certain. A lot of research is actually being done on that issue right now. The other thing that was developing at the time was monasticism. Right, so this is monasticism, it is uh, uh, communities of monks and nuns. Um, abbeys and, and, and monastic communities out in the wilderness. Um, a lot of people were, were turning away from the world and they were trying to live in solitary communion with God. They were trying to find God away from the cities and away from the sinful world. They were living ascetic lifestyles, right? This uh, is a picture here of an archaeological site. It was actually, uh, uh, this is actually an ancient Egyptian Christian monastery. 
um, it is out. It is called um, the. It was called uh, Fear Me, the Fear Me, and uh, it began as early as the fourth century um, A.D. Um, so math, monasticism is starting to develop, and that gave a lot of opportunities to women as well to find a path for themselves besides just getting married. Women could um, could decide to um, to not marry, to um, be chaste. Uh, their entire lives and dedicate themselves to the study of God. And we'll see this is a tradition that, that carries on into the Middle Ages and it really blooms in the Middle Ages. Um, so by the 4th century CE, um, the Emperor of Rome himself um, converted to Christianity. By that point there were a lot of Christians in the Roman Empire. It spread pretty far and wide. Um, Emperor Constantine was a very interesting character. You see his, his face is bust up here in, in the left-hand corner here. He was a very interesting man. As the Emperor of Rome, it made him the head of Rome, the Roman religion in and of itself. Um, and there's a lot of questions, though, as to um, whether his conversion was completely, um, uh, whether it's completely genuine or not, or, or if it was a political move so that he could um, uh, reconsolidate political power. But uh, myself, my own opinion is that um, since he was already the head of Roman religion, he wasn't gaining that much more political sway by um, converting to Christianity and becoming the head of the Christian religion. Um, but there, but there, is, there are arguments. There are arguments that he um, uh, might have converted for political reasons. In any event, in uh, 325, he convened uh, the Council of Nicene, which is a, a, a council of all the bishops from all over the Roman Empire, all of these leaders, um, and uh, he declared Christianity state religion. And he kind of, and he uh, kind of said, "Okay, let's agree upon the theology. Let's all decide once and for all which gospels are the real gospels, which um, letters are the real letters, which theology is the real theology." Um, <laughs> Uh, these were not easy decisions, and we know from uh, historical evidence that there was a lot of disagreements amongst the different bishops, and there were bishops writing letters home, there were churches back home, they were very concerned with what was going on in Rome, and, and there were letters going back and forth saying, well, this is what we talked about today, and this is what the arguments we're having, and and bishops saying, you know, no, I'm not going to, you know, allow them to change this or that about our theology, and so on and so forth. Um, but eventually they did um, kind of decide on the basic tenets of Christianity, specifically the Holy Trinity, that uh, the Christian God is a one single unified God who is, uh, has three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and uh, that Christ was both um, fully divine and fully human, right? Because there's that question about whether or not Jesus was just a man who was possessed by a spirit, whether he was um, God incarnate, you know, about what was the relationship between Jesus's divinity and his humanity. The Council of Nicene decided that he was fully human, but he was also fully divine. Um, and by uh, 380 CE, despite a lot of opposition, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and people were expected to convert. Um, uh, Constantine himself did not actually be baptized. Emperor Constantine was not baptized until he was on his deathbed. So he converted, but he didn't go through the baptism, right? We talked about how in order to be a full member of the Christian church, you have to have a baptism. So it's kind of interesting the way Constantine was kind of playing, was trying to play to, to, to the ancient, the old Roman families that didn't want to give up Roman religion and uh, the, modern, uh, the modern Christianity that was taking things over. Here's an image here, a famous uh, medieval image of the Council of Nicene and all the different bishops um, talking and, and trying to put together the, the, the Bible, trying to decide what the definitive Bible was. So the Council of Nicene came up with a creed. They came up with a, a very clear um, belief system for Christians to follow. 
And if you've been keeping track of the religions we've studied so far, this is really unique. Let's take a look at this. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, uh, Catholic meaning universal, so the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So of all the religions we have, Christianity is the only one that goes this far as to give you a creed. This is what we believe. This is exactly what we believe. This is exactly the way everything works. And you have to claim it. You have to claim the creed to be a Christian. Um, and certainly there are Christians who would disagree with the creed or they might say, well, you know, I, I believe in this, but not in that, or I don't know about this part. But um, the church, the Christian church is the only religion that does this. Belief becomes such an integral part of um, the Christian religion. And we're gonna see that by the middle ages, this, this dependency on belief and the right belief and the truth with a capital T becomes a double-edged sword for, for the Christian church. Um, it becomes a, a little bit of an issue, um, and still is today, um, in some ways. So uh, the Catholic Church, right? So the, the, this church that Constantine founded, or the, the bishops founded, was Catholic. It means universal. So they founded the universal church. Now everyone's on the same page. We all believe the same thing. We're all part of the same church. See you all, all on Sunday, right? Um, either you, you're with us or you're not in the church, the universal church. And that's what Catholic means. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman Universal Church. It's quite interesting um, when you compare this to all the other world religions. I'm sure you might not have thought of it like that before, how, how um, belief sets Christianity apart and the importance of correct belief in Christianity. Um, yeah, so... Um, by... Um, the problem is that by the 10th century, Christianity had spread across Europe and it spread as far north as Scandinavia, it spread into Russia. Um, these areas down here in this map had, were Muslim, but that, by that point, the Muslim empire had grown quite large. Um, but uh, the problem is that there had always been kind of a difference between the Western Church and the Eastern Church. Uh, one of the differences is that the Western Church used Latin and the Eastern Church used Greek. Some of the traditions that the Romans, the Roman, uh, the Western Church and the Eastern Church were, were a little bit different. The Eastern Church still practiced prostration on the ground, and to this day, the Eastern Orthodox Church still practices pro uh, prostration on, on Sunday services. Um, the the Western uh, Church um, did not. Um, the way they did small rituals, like the way they crossed themselves, was different. Um, in the East, they crossed themselves right to left, and the West, they crossed themselves left to right. It might be the other way around. I'm not, I'm not an either Catholic or Orthodox, so I don't know for sure, but there's a difference in that. There were also some differences in beliefs about um, the relation of the Holy Trinity, and that was a big one. Um, exactly the way the Holy Trinity worked and what the relation was between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit um, became kind of a sticking point between the East and the West. What kind of was the hair that broke the camel's back was the papacy. So um, the Bishop of Rome became, of, of the city of Rome, uh, became a major authority figure of all the bishops in all of the Christian world. And the Bishop of the city of Rome was called the Pope. Um, coming from the word for father, and uh, they and it was said that his position position was descended from that of Peter, um, one of Jesus's mo uh, most favorite disciples, um, whom he said he would make um, he would build the church upon. Um, so the Pope claimed the authority of Peter himself, the disciple, um, and um, by the Middle Ages, there was an issue that uh, the Pope saw himself as above not only religious powers, but he also saw himself above political powers. And through the Middle Ages, there would be always this kind of 
uh, political struggle, this, the struggle for power between the church and um, the, the kingships, the various um, political powers in Europe. Um, the Eastern Church basically re rejected the authority of the Pope, and in 1054, um, the Crusaders, by this point, the, the Christian Crusaders decided to travel all the way back to Jerusalem, which had been taken over by Muslims, uh, by Muslim Empire. Um, Christian kings decided to, to travel down here and to take Jerusalem back from, um, from the Muslims. Um, and on their way, they had to pass through Constantinople, which you can see right here. I don't know if you can see it. Constantinople right here, which was the seat of the Eastern Church and had this beautiful, still has this beautiful um, Hagia Sophia um, uh, Cathedral. And uh, the Western kings and their Western armies came in and they defiled the Eastern Church. And uh, the patriarch, who is an important Eastern Church leader, has a special seat that he sits in the Hagia Sophia when, when he's there for church services and only the patriarch can sit there. And um, some soldiers brought in prostitutes and they sat prostitutes in this chair and uh, they basically um, made a mockery of the Hagia Sophia, which is this very holy site. And it was kind of the last straw. Um, and in 1054, uh, there was the Great Schism, created the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. It was the first division in Christianity between the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. Um, not the first division, one, one of the major divisions though. And you can see this is kind of the line that was drawn. And this is still the line that exists in Europe t till today, right? This part of Europe is still um, Eastern Orthodox and this part of Europe is still Catholic, Roman Catholic. And up here it's Protestant, we'll talk about that later. Um, so in amidst all of these struggles for political power within the church and the papacy, um, there were a lot of Christians who were striving to maintain um, their spiritual purity and um, their, their, pi their piety towards God and not just the church, right? This took the form of intellectual revival uh, in the Middle Ages, monasticism, a lot of monasticism in the Middle Ages, and also mysticism. So around the 12th and 13th, 13th centuries, we have um, the, the foundation of a number of great universities, so the oldest universities in the world, University of Paris, um, Oxford, uh, universities all across Europe, a good, a good deal of Euro uh, universities in, in Germany. Um, they were often based upon cathedral schools that were, you know, the trained priests, because the, of course the, the Catholic Church has a priesthood. Um, and uh, these universities offered um, uh, offered education to to uh, won't say anyone. Women weren't always allowed, but almost anyone who could afford it and who was literate. If you could afford to go, and if you were literate, then you could go to these universities. And they taught um, philosophy. They taught classics. They taught. Um, sciences, what sciences they had at the time, but the, the, the most important thing that they, they taught was theology, right? Study of God. This was considered to be the greatest of all the sciences because it was believed that God created a, um, an orderly world based upon laws and rules and, and rationale and morality. So by understanding God, you could understand the world better. And this is uh, very much uh, the foundation of, of, of Western sciences. Um, Art and architecture thrived in the Middle Ages. Um, beautiful Gothic cathedrals were made that were meant to uplift the soul and to create a, a, a worthy seat for God uh, on earth. Um, there was uh, this great striving and monasticism for spiritual uh, purity, which um, was expressed in mysticism, a, a, a pure love and devotion for, for God and, and trying to um, separate yourself from the world to make your, get yourself closer to Jesus. Um, and it was largely through these monks and nuns that spirit, the Christian spirituality survived and spread, less so through the, the church administration, which was caught up again with a lot of issues of political power. And also music. Um, a lot of the, the developments in Western music at that time 
were made um, through monks and nuns who, who sang several times a day in their services or in, in their abbeys. So the last thing we'll talk about is mysticism. We talked a little bit about um, mysticism in the, in the East. The West mysticism has an interesting place because um, Western religions are get kind of caught up in rules and what is the correct thing to believe and what is not the correct thing to believe. Um, um, and uh, part of the problem that the church was having, it was claiming heresy on everyone. It was still, the church at the time was still, the church administration was still very concerned with um, heretical beliefs, wrong beliefs, right? Because you had a, a religion that was based on a historical narrative, a, a man who existed and, and, and taught very specific things um, and had a very specific relationship to God the Father Almighty. And um, uh, from the early days of Christianity, we've seen there, there was a great concern as to what right beliefs were. So the church got very caught up in that. The church administration got very caught up in protecting uh, correct beliefs. Um, but meanwhile, kind of down on the ground amongst the common people, um, a good deal, uh, many uh, people were turning to monastic life for mysticism. They weren't interested so much in perfect beliefs or a perfect understanding. They were more interested in love, the love of God, right? They were more interested in having transcendent, um, ecstatic experiences. And there are all these stories from the Middle Ages of um, various saints who had visions of, of Jesus, visions of angels, and felt, um, and, and, and they're all very different visions, they're all very different experiences, but all of them um, express that they feel this overwhelming, huge um, love, a love that God feels for them and that they return. Um, just a, a couple of mystics um, I'll, I'll highlight in this lecture. There was Julian of Norwich, who was a, a, an English woman who was a nun. Her picture's on the side here. Um, and she wrote um, a very, uh, she wrote a couple of famous um, um, writings, one of which is The Divine Lore, another one is called The Hazelnut. Um, and uh, as I say, monasticism was a great opportunity for women who, want, who were educated and who had minds of their own and didn't want to simply be wives and mothers for the rest of their lives. A lot of women turned to monasticism all over Europe um, and they were counted as saints they were counted as brides of Jesus they were counted as mothers of humanity um, and Julian of, Julian of Norwich was one of them um, she has uh, she's famous for writing about Jesus as a mother she compares so comparing Jesus to a man she compares Jesus to a mother for his um, maternal love his compassionate um, unending love for his children like a mother has and one of her famous quotes is our Savior is a true mother in whom we are endlessly born and out of whom we shall never come it's an interesting thought another of her famous quotes that's on this picture here she's famous for having a cat a lot of images of her show her with a cat um, on uh, one of her writings she talks about um, fears and doubts and, and kind of the horrible things that can happen to you in life and how um, troubles and tragedies in life can shake your faith. And, and she's famous for saying, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. So this is her expression of faith in God and faith in God's plan. Just relax and just know all shall be well. Everything's gonna be okay. That's what she's saying, everything's gonna be okay. Um, and she was very, her writings were very popular in the Middle Ages. Another famous mystic uh, was a German man named Meister Eckhart. Um, and he talks about God as being oneness, being, uh, his quote is that God is pure oneness, free, being free of any accretive multiplicity of distinction, even at a conceptual level. Uh, it's a very complicated sentence. Basically, what he and a lot of other German mystics were saying is that um, God, you, sh you shouldn't think of God as a person. You shouldn't think of God as a father or a son or a spirit. You should think of God as something that is completely um, beyond your understanding. Completely beyond your understanding. Um, God is pure oneness, pure oneness with the entire universe, oneness with each of us. It's kind of similar to a Hindu idea of Brahman, right? 
that the each of our souls is one with the Brahman. German mystics at the time were saying that our souls are one with God and that God is one with everything in this world. Um, so as the church was, was dealing with crusades and inquisitions and um, all these sorts of things, there were at the same time there were all these wonderful universities and monasteries and, and religious communities all over Europe that were more interested in the emotional and spiritual side of Christianity. Um, and we'll see in the next lecture how this all kind of comes together in the Enlightenment and what happens in the Enlightenment.